Amen. Um, before we begin today's sermon, let me just take a second. I've already addressed the children of our church, but I'd like to address our online community as well and just say thank you for the number of people that just stopped what they were doing and lifted up prayer requests on behalf of Camp Creek Church after the interruption of last week's broadcast. Uh, we uh, are blessed by you, and we're thankful for you. Having said that, let's turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to continue our study on the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, in Matthew chapter 6, last week we came to a transition period with the Sermon on the Mount where we started out where Jesus starts the Sermon on the Mount with these magical words about blessed, and then he just kind of shakes the earth because he says that people are blessed who nobody else in society were thought were blessed. It was really called the great inversion by many theologians, that people were blessed that nobody ever thought were blessed. It, it'd be akin today of coming out and saying, blessed are you who have skin blemishes, blessed are you who are diseased, blessed are you who have Alzheimer's. That would be the equivalent of what Jesus was saying back then. And the reason that they're blessed is not because they're inherently good or anything about themselves. The reason they're blessed is because the kingdom of God is breaking into the world through Jesus Christ himself. It's one of his first messages. Hey, I'm here. Kingdom life's available. And it's not based on our goodness because there's none righteous. No, not one. There's none that understandeth God. I'm quoting scripture right now. There, our righteousness is as filthy rags. But Jesus says, that's okay. You're blessed. And then he goes through a series, and this person's blessed, this person's blessed, this person's blessed. And then he takes steps, and he says, you know, this is how we live. Uh, don't get angry. If you find yourself angry, live, leave your gift at the altar and go fix it. Um, you know, if a Roman soldier comes up to you and says, carry my load for a mile like they were legally entitled to do, Go above and beyond and carry it two miles. And he goes through examples of how we live. Then he transitions. And this is where we were last week. And he says, hey, I want to talk to you right now about three things that can kill kingdom life. Three big things in our lives that will kill kingdom lives. And the first thing he talks about is a saying that we spoke of last week called almsgiving. So when you do your good works, when you're giving your money, do these kinds of things in private. Don't do them like the hypocrites do and the Pharisees do. And that was the first time that we've seen the word hypocrite in all of literature. I mean, Jesus is the first one to do it. So <laughs> if you're concerned about hypocrites in the church, so was Jesus. Then he goes to a second area, and this is where we're going to talk about today, but there are three areas. There's almsgivings, there's prayers, and there's fastings. And he wants to make sure that when we do these things, because they're good to do, but just do them with a pure motive. Check yourself is what Jesus is saying. So now what he's doing is he's starting to break into the, the second area of our lives, and he's telling us things in the kingdom that will kill kingdom lives. And because we do things, uh, we, we can keep doing things the way that we've been doing them, or, or we can change them up. I mean, we can keep using the hair dryer that dries out our hair and makes it brittle, or we can get the T3 Curalax negative ion hair dryer <laughs> and change it up. We could do things. That if we keep doing things the way we're doing, and we're going to get the same results. And Jesus says, here, let's talk about doing things a little bit differently because there are things in kingdom life that's going to change it. So this is what he says, Matthew chapter 5, starting with verse ch chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 5, he's going to teach us about prayer. And when thou prayest, Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street, that they may be seen of men. That's their purpose, to be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward, uh, because their reward is they wanted to be seen and they're seen. There's not much reward in that. You know? <laughs> then he says, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. So I want to establish something, and we just, we're going to keep on coming back to this. Jesus is not giving us, not changing out one set of legalistic rules for another set of legalistic rules. When you pray, Jesus says, the ultimate, what he's, his intention is, is that we pray and in secret, you, you don't have to go home and build a prayer closet. He's not mandating that you pray in a prayer closet. When he says, when thou pray, goest into thy closet to pray in secret. It's not another, he's look, you, we're looking at the intent of it. But, and we can show that through other verses in the New Testament. 
Um, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions. So the first thing is, is I want you to pray in secret. But when thou prayest, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. Don't be like them. For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, that our Father which art in heaven, or after this manner, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from an evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. So let's focus on the prayer aspect of today's message. We're going to get four things out of this teaching on prayer so that we can enter into the authentic relationship and avoid what Jesus is talking about avoiding. So the first thing we're going to talk about is praying sincerely, praying authentically, being real before God. Because there is a relationship between belief and prayer. Belief and prayer are kind of inextricable. Uh, There's a theologian by the name of Michael Novak, and this is what he says. He says, to come to recognize God is to become aware of standing in a conscious presence. To come to believe is to begin to pray. And, And this is because of the nature and the consistency of God's presence. What Michael is saying there is, you know, you're actually standing in a conscious presence of God at all times. And so to begin to understand that is actually the beginning of belief and prayer. So let's begin by looking and examining what it means to be in the presence of another person because we are continually in the presence of God. So I'm going to use my handy dandy chalkboard because when we're talking about communications, there's three different kinds of communications that we can do in the presence of somebody else. There's, there's actually speaking to somebody. You, well, you, you, know, you are my beloved. You're my true love. You're my soulmate. You're my split apart. Uh, I want you to go to the store. I want you to wake up. I want you to get out of bed, Caleb, to someone. Then there's actually speaking in front of someone. So here's this person, but you're not speaking to them. You're speaking to other people. That'd be like a jury trial, like Erica White is guilty. Or, um, hey, man, you're, when you're talking to the football team, Caleb had a great tackle, speaking in front of someone. But there's also another measure of being talking about the presence of people. It's actually the contrary of that. It's speaking in their absence when they are not there. Confession time. How many of y'all have said something in the absence of someone that you never would have said to their face, right? Well, let's talk about situation number one. Uh, situation number one. Situation number one, when you're speaking to someone. Sometimes the downside of that is when I speak with someone, I'm not being very authentic. You know, I hide certain characteristics. I see this all the time in a job interview. We're interviewing applicants, whether it was for a prosecutor or whether it to be a GBI agent. It's like, well, uh, what's your biggest weakness? <laughs> I work too hard. Okay, that is a guarded heart of someone who's not being very authentic. I have never in my 30 years on the workforce ever had someone say, well, you know, that's a great question. I think my biggest problem is is I'm just lazy. (laughs) Because we guard our hearts when we're talking to someone, right? Um, That's why some of you people can get first dates, but you can't get second dates. Because you don't guard yourself. I mean, sometimes we got to guard ourselves. So in situation number one, you know, we, we, we find ourselves where we guard ourselves. And, and this is part of what Jesus is getting to. When you're speaking to God, don't guard yourself. And when I bring God into the picture, the reality of this, when I bring God into the picture, the reality is, is I can have number one, I can have number two, but I can never have number three with God. I am never speaking in the absence of God. This is Psalm 139, Psalm 139, verses 7 8. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. 
But here's the thing. God allows us to feel as if we are sometimes away from him, and I think he does this for a reason. Uh, how many of y'all drive differently when you see a police officer on the highway? Just all of a sudden, you know, you go from 80 back down to the speed limit or something like that. You behave differently when you're driving and you see a squad squad car, and the reason is because you don't want to get a ticket. But see, here's the thing. God doesn't want us to do that. He doesn't want us to feel like he's that blue light that we see on the side. Oh, I got to watch myself. God is present. No, I think he allows us to sometimes feel as, as, he, as, as, if, as if he is absent so that we can, uh, we can change and grow and, and mature in him. I think he makes it possible for us to live as if he wasn't actually here, which sometimes leads to some really goofy expressions of spirituality. Have you ever noticed, and I noticed this when I was a kid, uh, when people were called on to pray, there were certain people who would pray in a manner that they... It's like they were speaking the king's English, you know, and they never, ever prayed... They don't speak to you, they, or those people who actually pray in a different voice. It, the Lord is utterly unimpressed with your, 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 your special language or your different voice. What Jesus is going to get at here is I want you to be authentic when you're speaking with me. There's nothing wrong with showing reverence, but just be careful when you're praying that you don't pray. And I used to remember... I would, you know, when I was a younger kid and I would hear people, and y'all know what I'm talking about because you've heard these people, and I, I would hear these people pray. My first thought was, oh, man, that's, that person's deep. But as I got older and listened to the substance, I'm like, oh, man, that's, or how about these? Ha! Have any of y'all ever sat under a 15-minute prayer? Oh, my stars. <laughs> All right. Um, woo! Uh, that, that's a hard one. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the Sermon on the Mount itself can be spoken in 20 minutes. I mean, okay. Um, but Jesus is saying when he's talking about prayer life, he says, hey, I, I want us to pray authentically, and yet we live large chunks of our lives as, as if God is absence in it. But he says, I want, you to, I want you to live authentically. I want you to pray authentically because I am always here and, and so that gets us to the second point, the goal of prayer, the goal of prayer, the goal of prayer. Here's the goal of prayer. It's not to get good at praying. The goal of prayer is not to set new records of how long your prayer can be. The goal of prayer is to live all of my life, speak all of my words in the joyful awareness of the presence of God. It's about all of life, of who I am as a person and the presence of God in my life. And you see this in some of the most striking passages in the Bible. This is in John chapter 11, verse 41 and 42. It says, And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. I knew that thou hurts me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou Hast sent me. This is right as he's about to raise Lazarus from the tomb. So Jesus, not just when he prayed, but he says, always God is listening. There is never a number three where we're speaking in the absence of God. Because for Jesus, the line was really thin. Actually, it was non existence between speaking to God and speaking in front of others to God. There, there was no number three. There's actually no line because Jesus said, you know, whether I'm doing number one or whether I'm doing number two, I'm always speaking to God. All my words are. So Jesus was often, this is one of the reasons when Jesus always consciously aware of the presence of God, that's what we're talking about now, being consciously aware of living in the conscious presence of God. Although Jesus was alone often, Jesus was never lonely. Although Jesus was alone often, Jesus was never lonely because he knew that he was always in the presence of God. And, and, and so what, 
<laughs> so this is what Jesus says. When you pray, I don't want you praying like the hypocrites who don't say a lot of, and, and you know, don't say a lot of words like the pagans. Pray privately. This is what I want you to do. He says in verse 6, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. In other words, get away from everybody. Because sometimes that changes how I pray. And it's real good to pray alone to the Father. There are things that really kind of trouble my heart sometimes that I will only pray to God in private. If I'm praying publicly in church, if I'm praying, I don't know, at a restaurant, there are things that that are on my heart that I, I cannot and will not pray publicly. And that's why Jesus says, you know what, we need to get to the deep stuff. <laughs> so if you want to get to the deep stuff, make sure there are times when you you get alone. So here's a question. It doesn't have to be a closet. What's your favorite room? You know, there was a study done of people, and they ask about their favorite room. You know, you want to know what the favorite room of young mothers is? It's the bathroom. <laughs> it's about the only place where you can, you can be left alone for just a few minutes of solace, right? The bathroom. But did you know that even the bathroom can be made to be a holy place? There is nowhere... It cannot be made to be a holy place when you're talking about our God. Our God is a big God. So uh, there's a paradox, though. There's a paradox here because there is a way in which you experience the presence of God only when you're alone. Only when you're alone. Um, And here's the idea. Because a human personality is kind of structured like the temple. Let me flip this real quick. Human personality is kind of structured like the temple. And if y'all remember the temple, the temple had the outer wall, but in there they had the inner inner court. And then in the inner court, and this court right here was called the holy of the holy place. And a lot of it, in here you had the court of the Gentiles, and you had the, you know, women could be allowed in here, and then in this section only the Israelites, and then to this section only the devout Israelites, and then there was the holiest of holies. And the human personality is structured a little bit like that when you think about it. When you think about walls that we put up, there are walls that only certain people they're allowed up to it, but they're not allowed there. But then there's like family, and the family might know. To this wall right here, what's going on in your lives? Um, but then, <laughs> then, 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 there's the holiest of holies, and that's the place where it's only you and God. I, I hear this expression sometimes. Somebody will say to you, you know, I know you better than you know yourself. What? How stupid is that expression? Can we just say that? Can we all just have a mass confession? That's idiotic. Nobody knows you better than you know yourself, but there is one person, and that's God. There is a place that God occupies in your life, and he knows your deepest needs that maybe you don't even know about. And it's the holiest of holy places. Um, And and this is the mystery, the depth, the beauty about you. Whether you are young or whether you are old, um, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, every single one of us has this space right here and only god is allowed in this space right here every one of us doesn't matter who you are young old rich poor black white we're all precious in his sight only god's allowed in there no other human can come in there nobody can force their way in there Power, money, influence will not get somebody in there. While I'm on it, let me just give a real quick uh, relationship tip for our young people that are looking for spouses. If you find somebody and all they ever do is compliment your exterior, run. (laughs) Because you are so much more than your body. You are a body, you are a soul, and you're a spirit. So if if you're a beautiful young lady or... Handsome young men, people, you got somebody on the other side, hi, ah, baby, you're just, you're just gorgeous, you're just, ah, you're just beautiful. Run, run, run. That is not a person you need, to, you need to stick with because what y'all need are people that are not interested in just this, but people that are interested and attracted to your heart and your soul. That's where the good stuff happens, and the really good stuff happens right there. So this is why you're going to find passages where people are often addressing their soul to God. Dig this, Psalm chapter 42, verse 6 and 7. David, oh my God, 
My soul is cast down within me. Deep calleth to deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. That's Psalm chapter 42, verses 6 and 7. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. You know what he's saying right there? There is a quality of love. And some of y'all who have fallen deeply in love with your true love, it's like when they come into your life, it's like water on a dry ground. And when he says deep, call it the deep, the deep that he's talking about is God, you're talking to my deep place. You're talking to my innermost sanctum. You're, 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 you, God, are talking to my soul. And those water spouts, that's the, Greek, the Hebrew word for waterfall. And you're coming over me, and your waves are coming over me, and they're watering my dry ground. Because have you ever known a soul that shriveled up? Or have you ever thought and felt like your shrill? Because your, your soul can be filled with joy and strength and peace and happiness and power, or it can be shriveled and neglected and dried and withered and beaten down. And people who just look at the outer you without seeing the inner you, they don't know you. And we live in a society that teaches us not to pay attention to the soul. We live in a society that is all about this exterior wall. Paying attention to that. There's a chunk of our society that doesn't even believe in the soul. And that that all you are is just a bunch of nerve endings and, 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 and wiring. But you have one of these things right here. You have a soul. And what Jesus is talking about, he's saying, pay attention to it. Find a place where you won't be distracted and pour your soul out to God. Sometimes it might be hard. Sometimes it might feel like a waste of time, but do it. This is what the Apostle Paul says, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Everything. You have a deep desire for a passionate relationship? Tell God. You have a deep desire to be successful in business? Tell God. You scared because of something happened at church? Tell God. Things aren't working out. The economy's in the tank. Looks like politics. The country's about to go crazy. Tell God. And some say, might say, you know, God might think I'm selfish. He already knows your thoughts anyway. <laughs> I mean, because remember, this is God we're talking about. And we never live in the absence of God. And the quickest way to kill your prayer life is, here's a warning, to pretend to care about something that you don't care about. So in prayer, start with what you really want. Now, people wonder, is there some secret way or attitude of, there's this thing called prosperity gospel, you know, name it and claim it. I'm not talking about that. No, 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 and a thousand times no. Um, what, what God wants is not for some to be manipulated by some magic words that you use. What he wants is your fellowship, a deeper fellowship where and as soon as you get vague or shallow or superficial or do the Miss America, all I really want is world peace, it creates a sense of artificiality, and it will kill your prayer life. That's why Jesus is addressing it right now. So when you pray, go off into secret. Don't use vain words. Don't use too many words. Just come to God with what you really want. Use the Lord's Prayer to remind us, I want the kingdom in my life. And that brings us to the next point. Number three, pray humbly. Because when we're looking at the Lord's Prayer and we're looking at this passage, what we're actually seeing is, is beggar's language. And I don't know about you, but I will sometimes forget when it comes to my life, my family, my problems, what matters is not that I'm smart enough or strong enough or gifted enough or big enough or connected enough. 
I'm most danger in danger when I have the feeling that I've got this all figured out. Um, I, and when I do that, I wind up flat on my back and, and, and just I, I feel helpless. But and having resources and job titles and connections, th- those can be good things, but the danger is they can keep me from realizing how desperately, desperately I need God and how I do not control anything. I am an asker and a beggar. When you pray, pray, our Father which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. A couple of things I love about this passage on prayer, if you would, as part of your homework assignment, go and underline how many times Jesus says our Father throughout this passage when he's teaching on prayer. And, and you know what's just kind of struck me when I was studying it this week? <clears throat> Jesus, well, let's, let's go back. I, I don't want to miss this point. <laughs> this is a good, good doctrinal point here. Um, starts out with verse 6. And when thou prayest, enter into thy closet that thou has shut the door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret, that thy Father, which is in secret, shall reward thee openly. And then he says, verse 8, Be ye not therefore like unto them, talking about the heathen, for your Father knoweth what things you need of before you ask of him. And then he says, when you pray, pray after this, our Father, which are in heaven. Now, I want you to kind of take yourself back 2,000 years ago to to, to, to the scene of the Sermon on the Mount. There's thousands and thousands of people on the Mount. And Jesus is talking to each one of them, and he's telling them, you're blessed, you're blessed, you're blessed, you're blessed. None of them had said a sinner's prayer. Th- these were the religious people who were kicked out. Jesus didn't talk about some future point in time. Jesus is talking to them right now, and he says, your father, your father, your father, your father. All these people. Do you know why? Because the relationship that we have with God is not based on what we do, what we say, or how we act. It's not based on our perfections, and it's not based on us being able to last and persevere into the end. The relationship that we have with God the Father is based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he knew when he was talking to that religious, illiterate crowd that were just sitting there listening to him, sometimes for the first time, he was talking to children of God. And so what he's talking about, as the Gospels always do, is how to strengthen the fellowship that you have with the Father who is your Father and will always be your Father. You can never lose the relationship that God has given you as one of His precious children. But your fellowship can always suffer. And one of the things He's warning us about is we can hinder our fellowship with God when we pray falsely, when we give out of an impure motive to be seen of men. And so he's teaching us here. He's teaching us. He says, look, when you pray, here's a couple of things I want you to do. I want you to pray sincerely. I want you to know that the goal of prayer is not words or repetition. The goal of the prayer life is to speak words in the joyful awareness of the presence of God. Then he says this. This is what I want you to do. I want you to I want you to pray humbly. And so he uses beggar's language because we don't have the resources. We are not enough on our own. And that takes us, and there's a great example of us in beggar's language. And it's in the book of, Hez- it's, in, um, it's in Isaiah. Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 37, there's this guy by the name of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah was a king, and he had received this letter and he got troubled by it because it was a threatening letter. So in Isaiah chapter 37, I believe it's, yeah, verse 15, it says, And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went it into the house of the Lord. And he spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed unto the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel that dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Incline thy ear, O Lord. Hear and open thine eyes, O Lord. See and hear all the words of Seneca. And now, therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. And God does. And, and, and one of the things I, I enjoyed about 
this particular prayer of Hezekiah is he starts out reminding it's he's he's talking to God, but in a sense when he's praying is he's reminding himself of how big God is. I would really encourage us in our prayer life to always remind ourselves how big God is, because the bigger we can make God, the smaller our problems appear. So what Hezekiah did is he got a troubling letter and he just he just spread it out before God. Here's a question for you. What's on your letter? Like today, if you were thinking, I've I've got a troubled soul. That's what's on your letter. And so maybe following the example of Hezekiah, just take your letter and just spread it out. Spread it out before God. And God cured it for Hezekiah, you know. Have you ever, have you ever gotten a troubling piece of news or maybe a hot email, an indication in some form that things aren't going to go well? Maybe it was a phone call from the doctor. Well, just, just lay it out. So let's, let's talk about letters in the few minutes that we have left. Because you can lay out these letters, whether you're holding the hand of your true love at Zaxby's or whether you're by yourself at a Taco Mac or eating appetizers. You can do this anywhere. You can do it in a secret place. You can do it it just standing there quietly in your mind. I tend to do it a lot of times when I'm driving to work. And I just have my alone time, and I just take the things that are just troubling me out, and I'll just lay them out, just lay them out before God. So what's your letter? A relationship, a stack of bills, news about your job, a person that's a long way from God, maybe a divorce, um, a death certificate. Maybe it's news from the doctor. Just lay it out before God and say, God, you know, here it is, and I can't fix it. And it's good that we can do that. For a lot of you, the name that's going to go on your letter is the name of a person because we have these people in our lives, and we would love to fix them. How are you doing with that? <laughs> it reminds me of the story of a hunting dog got taken to a camp to get trained, and the wife drops off the dog and asks if she could drop off the husband to get fixed as well, right? <laughs> Fixing people. You, you know what you're trying to do when you're trying to fix people. You, you're, trying to, you're trying to fix them, but what really needs to be changed is what's right in here. And only God can change that. So if you're trying to fix somebody, I want to give you some relief today. Stop. Turn it over to God, because what kills us is we can't fix people we love, and there's a real good reason for that, because everyone, every, everyone has one of those holiest of holies, and we think I can intimidate, I can lecture, I can flatter, I can manipulate, and maybe I can in the outer court, but I can't touch what's on the inner court of their soul. And you know what? It's a really good thing that I can't do that, because as much as you love them, it's a good thing you can't get your fingers on what's on the deepest part that only God can. And this is prayer. Prayer is that closet we come to and where we try to, try to, try to ask our Lord, Lord, fix. Fix their heart. Fix their soul. Fix it, Lord, because only you can. Here's the last thing that I want to take away from this. We want to pray humbly. We want to know that the goal of our prayer is to know that we're always in the conscious awareness of the presence of God. We want to pray authentically, but the last thing that we want to do is we want to pray boldly because there's that word that keeps coming up. You know, pray to your Father. Your Father will reward you. Your Father knows what you need. Our Father, which is art in heaven, how much more will your Father give you the good gifts to those who ask? And and it's that, that, that prayer, that, that bold prayer that we can say. And Jesus says, I want you to do it. And I want you to think about what is the deepest level of your heart, what it is that breaks your heart. Maybe it's a health deal. Maybe it's a person, a son, a daughter, a marriage, a betrayal, guilt, loneliness, addiction. Maybe it's an abortion that you had. Just take it, write it on that metaphorical piece of paper, take it to the Lord and say, Lord, here's my heart. Here's my heart. Because God is always present. But what Jesus is saying in this Sermon on the Mount is, now you're aware of it. Now you're aware of it. So come to him, come freely, come authentically, come boldly, and just bring your care and concern to him. Um, there was one time when uh, Josh was six years old, and we were crossing a four-lane busy street going to a Waffle House of all places. <laughs> And I had his hand, and I was holding it a little bit firmly, and we crossed the first two lanes, we crossed the turn lane, 
and there were cars just, and for some reason, my son just jacked, jerked away and ran, and a car was coming and just had to, like that. And the only word I could see, because I could see the car, and I felt Josh leaving my hand. I couldn't control it, and I just, the only thing that could come out of my mouth is, God. I, I couldn't even formulate the rest of the sentence, protect my idiot son. I, <laughs> and, and the car, so, and I'm just like, oh, thank you. And I get over there, and I, I hold them, and my, I literally collapsed on the ground. My, it just, it was one of the, I mean, you understand what I'm saying? It was one of those moments. You don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to pray long prayers. It doesn't have to be in the King James English. It, it could just be from the sincerest, innermost part of your heart. But God, but he knows. Because of the conscious awareness and the presence that we live in, he knows all our needs and all our concerns. And what Jesus says is, come. Just come. Don't dress it up with fancy pretenses or long words of flowery language. Just come with your heart because that's what your Father wants. Just come. There's so much power in that. So much. So if you would, let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll close out our sermon today. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come to your house. We thank you that we have a, a place that we can meet safely. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you when we're scared, when we're overcome, when we've got problems, when we have sickness, when we're aware of sickness in other people. And we thank you, Lord, for the power of prayer. We thank you, Lord, that we get to do that any day, anytime, anywhere. Lord, we thank you for that privilege that is our Father, the one that knows the deepest part of our hearts, that you want, that you're not turned off by the ugly stuff, but because of grace and because your Son died for us, gave us his life. Lord, we thank you we can, we can come to you with all the ugliness of our lives and that your love doesn't change. There is no variable or shadow of turning that nothing can separate us from you. Lord, thank you for that safety because ultimately, Lord, that's the safety that we all rely on every single day. Lord, thank you for all the prayer requests that have been lifted up and those that haven't been lifted up because you know our needs because you're God and you're big and we ask you to bless us. Lord, thank you for the goodness that, that you reveal yourself to us in every way, whether it's uh, people charging to stand in the gap or people staying to protect the flock. Lord, thank you. Thank you that we see you in the lives of other people. Lord, help us to see you more vividly because you're all around us. We're never apart from you. We're always with you. Lord, help us to feel you when we reach across the table and, and hold the hand of the one we love to pray when we change a diaper, when we turn off the TV just to spend time with loved ones. Help us to connect and, and feel you more vividly. Father, thank you for the sister churches that are concerned about us and even those that don't know that we exist. Bless them so that your children, regardless of what church they're attending right now, they can feel you. And for your children that are not in a church building right now, whether they're having a hangover or they're just sick, Lord, move in them. Last blessings on our country. just seems like we're about to split apart, but you're bigger than our country and you're bigger than our political parties. You're bigger than the personalities on TV. And we know that no matter what happens, God, you're in charge and you're big. We pray for our healing for our country, both spiritually and, uh, Lord, for the division that's occurred. Go with us now. Strengthen us on those days we get down and remind us of your presence many times over. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.